So I'm so happy to have Brianna here again. Um, Brianna prefers to be called Ms. B, and she's conducted symposiums aimed at the development of people and agencies for over 30 years throughout the Bay Area for medical practitioners and community-based organizations and city and federal agencies in San Francisco, Alameda, Long Beach, San Bernardino, all across the state. And she's developed and presented learning events focused on nurturing traumatized women and men with physical, emotional, and mental injuries. Her training portfolio includes When Compassion Hurts, Trauma-Informed System 101, Healing Circles for Grief and Loss, Medically Fragile Children 0 to 5, Anxiety, Grief, Depression, What's the Difference, Codependency 101, Agency Healing, um, Ms. Moore provides direction and guidance to assist uh, clients and staff with staying focused on important elements in their life. I'm so pleased that you're here today. And it, it was a special training that I asked Brianna to bring to us because I thoroughly believe in the therapeutic qualities of all the providers that are in our community working with families and children that go way beyond the license or way beyond credentials that... Um, people have. So just wanting to deepen and enhance those skills. And one of the things that I mentioned to Brianna as we were um, this morning, as we were preparing was that the, the words listen, the word listen and the word silent are made up of the same letters. And I think that's kind of a significant thing when we think about listening and becoming a listener. So without any further ado, Brianna, thank you so much. I'll be here and happy to monitor the chat as we go along uh, if people have questions or want to raise their hand. So take it away, Ms. B. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your day to show that you care about being a more serious and a more helpful care provider. And one of the things I want to say to you that's really, really important to me from my heart to your heart is thank you for the work that you do. The work that you do is a calling and it's a vocation. Nobody wakes up and say, oh, let me go and see how I can work with the most disenfranchised, hurt and toe up people in the world and children that are so vulnerable and have so many uh, adverse childhood experiences. But you all step up to the plate to do that. And you suit up and show up every single solitary day. And that's what you do when you are in a calling, when you are in a vocation where you are con connected and committed to serving people who have wounds and injuries. And people who serve people who have wounds and injuries, I call them wounded healers. And I know that I am a wounded healer. I do this work because some of the wounds that I've had in my childhood as well. I grew up in the projects in Petrell Hill. I had one mother, my dad died when I was 12 years old. So all of these adverse experiences I've had as well. I'm a recovering addict. I've been clean for 35 years. I have a wonderful, wonderful son and two great grandchildren and a lovely daughter-in-law. I'm retired and I'm enjoying my life. And I love Miss Beth because she always gives me the opportunities to create something at a moment's notice. <laughs> In some kind of way, I always wind up getting it done because you all matter. You matter so, so much. You know, I had a brother who had uh, suffered with schizophrenia and it was people like you, you know, service providers, people who work in the clinics and people who just stick their hand out, who loved him with compassion and with empathy. And so that's what we're going to talk a lot about today, because I believe that being kind is something that we have forgotten how to be to, with one another. And that it's important that we understand and realize and remember that this pandemic has caused us to be different with ourselves and different with one another. Sometimes you get a text message and you read into it something that wasn't even the person's intention. We're being a little bit more prickly with one another and not showing as much grace as we used to. The reality of it is, is that we've never experienced anything like this, where you have to walk around with your face all covered up and you can't touch anybody. And if you hug somebody, they think you got the cooties or you think they have the cooties. And it's just a hard, hard way to go. And so I want to say, I want to name that for you and put it out there for you and let you know that we are not alone. We are not alone. 
And so one of the things that we can do for ourselves first is make sure we have a great self-care regime. I do a self-care training and I come back and I ask people, so which one of those things did you do? Oh, Miss B, I ain't had time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Well, I'm the president of the Ain't Nobody Got Time for That Club. I got the t-shirt and the mug right? So what's important for you to know is that when you step back, relax, and pay attention to how you feel in your body, that will help you understand, oh, this stress is a little bit too much, and I might need to take a step back. Some of you may have a therapist. Some of you may not have a therapist. Some of you are providing therapeutic services to people, and you're not licensed or credentialed. And all that means is that you're being kind and that you're listening and that you're being present moment to moment for somebody who just needs somebody to say, I care. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I thank you so much for your comments as well. And one of the things that I've learned about myself uh, during this pandemic is that I can grow things. My house only had one plant, two plants maybe before the pandemic. Now, they're everywhere. Plus, I'm growing tomatoes and peppers and bell peppers. I just turned into Farmer, farmer Sally. And this is how you know you're really an old person when you start naming your plants. All my plants have names. And this plant, this plant right here is a monstera. And this plant is called Miss Beth. So Miss Beth, and she's just growing with two new leaves. And we've been friends for 20 years, so I thought I, she needed to have a plant. Uh, and that's heavy. Oh, that is so cute. <laughs> Thank you, Priyana. <laughs> My best Good friend. <laughs> I'll send you a picture of her. Maybe even try to get a little leaf off so you can have it too. So, okay, let's get started. You guys, it's... um. It's important to be able to chime in. And so if I say something you understand, just raise your hand and Beth and Leah are monitoring that. And if I'm going too fast, I have a tendency to talk fast. And if I'm going too fast, you can say, hey, 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 slow down. I didn't get that. Okay. And then I think you will all get a copy of the presentation as well. Okay. Okay. So the title of this learning event, I don't call them trainings anymore because training is what you do with dogs. So this is a learning event where I will share my experience, strength and hope with you about it's nice to be nice, how to be kind and empathetic and how listening helps you with that. So this is, um, it's my mom and she always said, and that's where the name of this came from. So she's telling you hi, even though she's made her transition 13 years ago. Uh, she used to always say, when me and my brother were acting up, she was my brother and I, pardon me. And I might split some verbs every now and then. I'm 70 years old, so it's okay. I could, you know, not use perfect English. I do know how to speak, but sometimes I go straight to the vernacular. Okay, so just have some grace with me about that. And she used to always say, it's nice to be nice. And it's nice to let other people know you're nice. And then she would say my name in a way that knew that she knew that I knew that she knew. I knew that she knew that I knew that. I was in trouble. She would say, Brianna, that's not nice. It's nice to be nice. And it's nice to let other people know you're nice too, baby. So don't be that way, okay? And I was straighten up. So um, my social location, I'm gonna cut this down here. My social location is in Rio Vista, California. And like I said, I'm a grandmother of two boys. I'm retired for two years from the city and county of San Francisco, where I worked with people and families who were unhoused. My last two years were spent managing a SAMHSA grant in collaboration with the Bay Area Mental Health Agencies and San Francisco Department of Public Health as a project director for trauma-informed systems. And I wanna say some of the information that I might give to you today, you may have heard before, and some tools you may have experienced before, but the purpose of it is to help you remember that when you're stressed out or when you are not being able to listen to those people in front of you, uh, you can just take a moment and take some deep breaths. And I'll give you some tools to be able to work with that. So before we begin, I want to honor those who came to these lands before us, those indigenous tribes, those who were brought over here as enslaved captives, and those who immigrated here to seek peace and grace. I thank you for standing and dying and suffering so we could all be present here today together to do the work necessary to help people 
and to heal ourselves as we work with others on their journey of healing. So our goals for today are four, just four small goals. Um, first, I'm gonna talk to you about the signs and symptoms of stress and chronic, chronic stress and give you some tips and tools on that. And then give you some information about the difference between learning and healing and the differences between active and passive listening, which is really one of the top skills for anybody in the therapeutic arena. We don't give advice. I forgot to tell you that I'm a therapist too. So we don't give advice. What I do as a therapist in my practice is just to help people think about things in a different way, to have them understand that, that, that their feelings are important and necessary. And so I help people learn how to name. You'll be surprised at how many people are disconnected from their feelings. And I say, well, how does that feel? It's like, I don't know. Well, what do you think about that? I don't know. But one of the tips and techniques that I use is like, okay, well, let's just sit here for a moment and see if something else comes up. So most of my clients know that I don't know still is gonna require a little bit of work, right? And maybe you might not know, but if you're quiet and you go in then, and you have a building, a relationship around trust, trust, relationships are important in order for people to feel safe enough and comfortable enough to tell you what's really going on. And so the way that you're able to do that is to be able to practice empathetic listening. We're also going to look at empathy from a social cultural lens and ways to hear others who do not come from your culture. People look different, especially in this country in these days. And how does implicit bias impact how you listen and see and feel other people? So those are some of the things that we're going to we're going to roll through today. So what I want you to do, and this is an interactive training. And I would like for you to put in the chat one word that you're feeling, your one word feeling right now in a bubble. If you would think about how you're feeling right now, just one word. And then also, I would like to invite you to close your eyes for a moment. And let's start with the deep cleansing breath, which is in through your nose to the count of four and out through your mouth through the count of five. And in that breath, Notice if there's any part in your body that tells you you're feeling stress. Could be your neck, could be your fingertips, could be your tummy, could be your head, any of those areas. Just put that in so we could have an idea just how much in alignment we really are. And we'll come back to that in a moment. So why is this important? Tell me, has anyone in this room not experienced no stress within this past week? Let me come on cameras. If you have, raise your hand because you're a special kind of person. No stress. We all have stress going on these days. And chronic stress and trauma can affect our health, our relationships, and our work. And when there's abundance of stress, there's no space for empathy for others. With empathy, we can listen to those we are serving because we all have a stake in creating a more safe, supportive, and healing work and care environments. It might be nice to dream that all of our stress might just melt away because our lives are just so relaxing. But for most of us, that is far from reality. So before we talk about empathy and listening and self-care and how we could be therapeutic without be, go, have, being a therapist, let's talk a little bit about stress, which is the number one reason people go and seek a therapist actually, because they don't know what to do with their stress. But we do know that stress is a part of our daily lives. It comes in many forms. We may think of stress as connected to bad things, but sometimes good things can cause stress too, like getting married or buying a house, having a baby, getting a new job being on time, showing up for a training. These are all kinds of things that could be exciting life events, but that still may be the source of tremendous stress and anxiety. Some stressors may be considered mild and manageable, while others are more severe and have a more damaging long-term impact on us and our emotional health. It is important, however, to remember that stress is in the eye of the beholder. What is very stressful to you may not cause your coworker to worry at all. 
Likewise, you may be bothered by the same things that annoy your best friend. This does not make one person stronger or weaker than another, just different. Stress lies in the ability to recognize your stressors and act accordingly. By going to helping professions, you have chosen work that leads you to walk with your clients through many, many difficult, complicated, and often painful experiences. Since our stress is a part of our daily lives, we must pay attention to its impact on our physical, emotional, and emotional well-being. The mind and the body are constantly influencing and altering one another. Stressful experiences, however, that are constant can lead to exhaustion, overreaction to less stressful events, or overreaction to less stressful events, and symptoms of anxiety and depression. Here's what I want you to know. The physical toll of this constant state of increased stress comes in the form of various illnesses, physical complaints such as insomnia, backaches, headaches, stomach aches, high blood pressure, and even heart disease. There was some research that showed that black women die from congestive heart failure 49 times more than any other group. Why is that? It's because we hold our grief and our worries and don't talk to anybody about it and that causes congestive heart failure. So that's why it's important to be able to get somebody, have your accountability buddy at work or somebody that you value to be able to talk with. Even if you cannot get into therapy day by day, it's important to have somebody that you can share what's really going on with you. This says, I'm a little stressed right now. So just turn around and leave quietly and no one will get hurt. Some days we feel like that some days, right? So let's begin with a sh basic shared understanding of stress. Uh, and so stress, it comes when you become overwhelmed with life pressures that causes the hormone adrenaline. The adrenaline is a chemical in your brain to be suddenly released. Results from a sensory stimulation, what you see, what you hear, what you taste, what you feel, and what you smell. So one of your sensory, uh, sensory stimulations will cause you to feel stress. You might see something, driving in a car, somebody stops in front of you. Oh my God, that stress comes, right? You might hear something, you might taste something that just, it gives you, Ugh, I hate that, but I have to eat it, Ugh, right? Something you feel, so you, somebody that you might see, might cause you to feel stress. Here's the, thing, the deal though. When the stressor is removed, the body is supposed to calm back, return to the normal calm state. We call that settling. The breath slows, the heartbeat slows. And like I said, stress can be a positive motivator. But then we have anxiety. So anxiety when the stress that is continued even long after the stressor is removed. So whatever caused you to be stressed out is gone, but you're still feeling that sense of heightened awareness. Your heart is still palpitating. You're still breaking out into a cold sweat, right? Your, your heart is racing. You find it difficult to get a deep breath. That is anxiety. And then finally, we have chronic stress. Chronic stress is the response to emotional pressure suffered for a long period of time in which an individual perceives they have little or no control. It can occur in response to everyday stressors as well as to exposure to traumatic events. Can we say pandemic is causing us to feel chronic stress? The individual has little or no control over a prolonged period of time. So know that every single solitary person on the planet is suffering from some chronic stress and other people have probably uh, moved to post-traumatic stress disorder, which is um, having a high level of stress over extended period of time. Now let's just take a, a look at chronic stress. And these are the areas on the body that might call, be the cause of chronic stress, headaches, just a constant dull, 
feeling in your head that kind of never goes away. Your hair starts falling out. You may notice that you're having more breathing trouble now. Well, with all these fires, that could be some of that too as well. Heart disease, weight gain. Everybody calling them COVID pounds, right? Uh, poor health in your gut. You're noticing that your stomach feels more unsettled than before. And then of course, diabetes. So last year, we were not sure when this pandemic would end, but life as we know it has changed. There's a new normal that will be with us for a long period of time. Wearing masks, washing your hands, and vaccinations for some people. We are surprised, however, at what we can handle. And we may find ourselves being a little bit more prickly with others as well as ourselves. So Beth, you wanna read what they put in the chat about um, their feelings? Yeah, there's so many, so many great things people said. Um, okay. A lot of people are feeling um, tired. And mm. it. There's some people that are excited and curious and ready. Um, people have gratitude. People are feeling kind of sensitive, um, some pressure, mm -hmm. people stressed. Um, and then places, people put in places where they're feeling their, their stress or their pressure in their shoulders and their jaw, um, in their back, um, mm. in their head, a bit sad, um, a lot of shoulders. So, mm -hmm. um, and some people in their lower back and their stomach or in their temples. Mm. Um, yeah. Some people are feeling sad. Um, number of people have headaches, forehead, um, body aches. Um, some people are feeling good, peaceful. Right. Yeah. So it's really a um, thank you, everybody, for sharing or in their neck. Uh, so a lot of great responses. Appreciate everybody sharing. Yeah. So a couple of things about that. If you're feeling stress and tension in your back, in your neck and your shoulders, it means a Louise Hay. She is a wonderful woman. She healed herself from cancer and she did a lot of work on affirmations. So um, there's a, a book that she wrote about your body and knowing where that stress fits and feels in your body. So whenever you feel it in your neck and your throat, your throat, you're being silenced. It's something that you need to say that you're not saying. Your neck and shoulders, this means you're carrying an extra burden. Life is burdening you. And so you want to think about what is that situation that's causing me to feel burdened? Could be work, could be personal, and it most probably is this pandemic. So I would just want us to clarify that. So thanks a lot. So now let's, let's uh, switch over to uh, looking at trauma. And this will tell you how to understand trauma. Trauma is an event, an experience, and an effect. And it actually causes extreme danger, an actual danger or extreme threat of harm. And it could be experienced directly or indirectly. So if you're watching the television and you're watching someone get killed or murdered or hurt, that's actually happening, like we watched George Floyd, that is the kind of extreme threat of harm that is experienced indirectly. You weren't there, but you watched it on TV. So your experience of that is either fight, flight, or freeze, which leaves you helpless. Despite your efforts, you're helpless to escape the traumatic event. And then this overwhelms our brain and our body. And then this leads to disintegration or dysregulation. What does disintegration and dysregulation mean? It means that you're feeling fragmented, that you don't know whether to stand up or sit down or go forward or go back. And this leads to a sense of dysregulation. Your rhythm is off, right? You have a flow and a rhythm about you. And with a traumatic event, it feels like you just can't get back in the game right now. And so this is an opportunity with this dysregulation and disintegration, it could have lasting effects and could very, very, very well be quite dangerous on your mind, your body, and your spirit. I wanna invite you to take a breath and blow it out. So, um, 
when you are stressed out, like I said, your body goes into fight, flight, or freeze mode. And so what happens is that that yellow, that prefrontal cortex goes offline, and then your survival brain comes into uh, controlling everything. Brain takes over, and it behaves like a past trauma is happening right now. So you're not able to think, and you're not able to reason, and you're not able to be present when your thinking brain is offline. You're just in what we call survival mode, right? Oops. Yeah. Okay. So when you're in survival mode, this is a good, a good way to know whether you're in survival mode or not. So paying attention to A, B, and C, that is the client cycle. So you're meeting with the client or a parent or your boss, um, and something happens and the person on the A, B, and C, the client side, or you, becomes activated, right? And so as this activation continues to escalate, the other person that's listening is also escalating. But then as the initial person, the client or you, starts to de-escalate, what you'll notice is that the responder is also still escalating quite a while before they begin to de-escalate. But what's important here is the highest point for each person is at the lowest point of the cognition cycle. That means that if you're having an argument with somebody, and somebody, you are arguing back and forth with one another, right? And nobody is listening. Your cognitive abilities are offline. And so you're not thinking with your reasonable mind. You're acting and responding with your, uh, with your uh, survival brain. So one of the things that's really important here is that you just stop. Take a deep cleansing breath in through your nose, hold it out through your mouth. Notice what you're feeling in your body. Reflect on what you could do at this time and then respond. Your response could be, you know what? This is too much for me right now. I think I'm gonna go take a walk. I need to go get some water. Let's just back up for a moment and come back together when we're both able to deal with this as a reasonable adult or human being. You might have to do that with your kids. You might have to do that with your students. You might have to do that with your coworkers. But taking a step back, it shows a, strength, a sense of strength, not a sense of weakness. And one of the things that you could do and notice when you are uh, traumatized, so this is about the window of tolerance. So when you're in your window of tolerance, you feel like you could, you're on top of the world and everything, you could deal with everything. You might feel some stress or pressure, but it doesn't bother you as much. This is an ideal place to be. When I go to the beach and sit by some rocks and watch the water splash up on the rocks, definitely know that I'm in my window of tolerance. Right. I might go there because I'm either hyper aroused, which is anxious, angry or out of control, or I might feel spacey and zoned out or numbed or sad or feeling a sense of grief or loss. So you could have either one of those areas when you are dealing with a traumatic situation. And anybody who has a reaction to a traumatic situation, it's a tendency, research shows that it's something that happened in your childhood that got activated again. So you're not really responding to what's happening right here and right now in the present, but rather some wound that you had in your life as a child. And that person that you're dealing with, you want to ask yourself, who does that person remind me of? And you might be responding to that person because that person reminds you of somebody who caused you some hurt, harm, or danger. So when you're dealing with children or you're dealing with your supervisor and they respond to you in a way that's out of character, try to figure out who you are reminding them of so that you can help them get back into their window of tolerance as well as you get back into your window of tolerance. Now let's just watch a little uh, video that kind of summarizes everything that I said.
cramming for a test? Trying to get more done than you have time to do? Stress is a feeling we all experience when we are challenged or overwhelmed. But more than just an emotion, stress is a hardwired physical response that travels throughout your entire body. In the short term, stress can be advantageous, but when activated too often or too long, your primitive fight or flight stress response not only changes your brain, but also damages many of the other organs and cells throughout your body. Your adrenal gland releases the stress hormones cortisol, epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, and norepinephrine. As these hormones travel through your bloodstream, they easily reach your blood vessels and heart. Adrenaline causes your heart to beat faster and raises your blood pressure, over time causing hypertension. Cortisol can also cause the endothelium, or inner lining of blood vessels, to not function normally. Scientists now know that this is an early step in triggering the process of atherosclerosis, or cholesterol plaque buildup in your arteries. Together, these changes increase your chances of a heart attack or stroke. When your brain senses stress, it activates your autonomic nervous system. Through this network of nerve connections, your big brain communicates stress to your enteric or intestinal nervous system. Besides causing butterflies in your stomach, this brain-gut connection can disturb the natural rhythmic contractions that move food through your gut, leading to irritable bowel syndrome, and can increase your gut sensitivity to acid, making you more likely to feel heartburn. Via the gut's nervous system, stress can also change the composition and function of your gut bacteria, which may affect your digestive and overall health. Speaking of digestion, does chronic stress affect your waistline? Well, yes. Cortisol can increase your appetite. It tells your body to replenish your energy stores with energy-dense foods and carbs, causing you to crave comfort foods. High levels of cortisol can also cause you to put on those extra calories as visceral or deep belly fat. This type of fat doesn't just make it harder to button your pants. It is an organ that actively releases hormones and immune system chemicals, called cytokines, that can increase your risk of developing chronic diseases, such as heart disease and insulin resistance. Meanwhile, stress hormones affect immune cells in a variety of ways. Initially, they help prepare to fight invaders and heal after injury, but chronic stress can dampen the function of some immune cells, make you more susceptible to infections, and slow the rate you heal. Want to live a long life? You may have to curb your chronic stress. That's because it has even been associated with shortened telomeres, the shoelace tip ends of chromosomes that measure a cell's age. Telomeres cap chromosomes to allow DNA to get copied every time a cell divides without damaging the cell's genetic code, and they shorten with each cell division. When telomeres become too short, a cell can no longer divide, and it dies. As if all that weren't enough, chronic stress has even more ways it can sabotage your health, including acne, hair loss, sexual dysfunction, headaches, muscle tension, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, and irritability. So, what does all this mean for you? Your life will always be filled with stressful situations, but what matters to your brain and entire body is how you respond to that stress. If you can view those situations as challenges you can control and master, rather than as threats that are insurmountable, you will perform better in the short run and stay healthy in the long run. I hope that clarified things for you a little bit. And then one of the things that's important um, in uh, a must-have skill in therapy is able to set boundaries. So providing appropriate perimeters within which it, a person who works with a, an individual is foundational to the therapeutic success. This skill enables professionalism to exist and the, it strengthens the client 
uh, practitioner relationship. So having and setting boundaries is very difficult for most of us. We do know when we reach the point of no return, when our boundaries are bashed, there's no empathy, there's no listening, there's no active, actively or pa listening is actively or passively out of reach. It's important to focus on the things you can control and release the situations that are not within your arena. So taking a look at what are the things within your span of control and what are the things that are outside of your span of control. So hearing versus listening, we're gonna switch gears here from stress and trauma to listening. This is a key essential element of being therapeutic without being a therapy, a therapist. Hearing and listening requires some action and requires conscious effort and concentration and interest and empathy for the person to whom we are listening. So hearing is a passive process and listening requires conscious effort, concentration and interest in what is being said by the other individual. So there are stages to listening. Receiving, understanding, remembering, evaluating, and feedback. And this process happens so rapidly. Like you're hearing my words now, and you're going into stage two where you're understanding it. You may, you may be making notes so that you can remember it. Evaluating it based on what you already know, your experience, strength, and hope in comparison to what you are seeing, hearing, and feeling through this presentation. You're determining what the value of the information is. Is it relevant? Is it important? Is it new? Have I heard it before? And then you might even share and give some feedback. Feedback through open-ended open questioning. Authenticity. Ah. Hello? Hi, Maria, would you mute yourself? Let me see if I can mute you. Okay. Okay, so the types of listeners. Research shows that there are four types of listeners, the detached listener, the passive detached listener, the involved listener, and the active listener. And we go in and out of these types of listening. Nobody is always detached and nobody is always active. It depends on the situation. It depends on how you're feeling in your body. It depends on your level of stress, what you're experiencing. Are you having some anxiety? Do you like this person that's sitting in front of you? Do you not like them? Do you want them to have more? All of these are different types of ways that we engage as listeners. So the detached listener is not present or focused on what's being said. Their emotions appear to be blunted and could even be frozen like in fight or flight. A person who has experienced some trauma and is disassociated could be a detached listener. They're focusing on what happened to them rather than what's going on in the present moment, right? Some of you are gonna be a detached listener throughout this presentation because something else is gonna pop into your mind that you need to give some attention to and you have to redirect yourself to come back. The passive listener acts as if they're listening, but again, are not really present. An example of that is a teenager that you're correcting and all they're doing is sitting there as a pass passive listener because they really wanna get their game back or get their phone back, which you have taken because they're not paying attention to you or they haven't done their chores or their homework isn't done. My grandson was over here over the weekend. I have the two of them. And so one of them had these fingernails, you know, 13 year old fingernails is probably the nastiest thing in the whole wide world. But I had his phone because he was up at two o'clock in the morning playing video games. And so I could get him to cooperate. I gave him a manicure. He even let me put some oil in his hair and lotion on his face. Now, 13 years old, don't do that. But he was a passive listener. And then finally, he was so sweet, I gave him his phone back. An involved listener is somewhat more engaging and present. A new friend or someone who is teaching a subject that you are interested in might look up here and uh, uh, now and then and provide a small amount of feedback, but it's not. Uh, not always totally engaged, but it's not a good or bad thing. Again, remember, there's no judgment here. Everybody has, has to go into one of these states for your own self-preservation. And then the active listener is engaged, interested, and fully present.
So there is a difference between active listening and passive listening. Active listening reacts and responds and is present. In my community, uh, we have what's called call and response as an active listening way of being. So a minister, for example, will say, can I get an amen? Or I wish somebody would, he was here and the audience will give him a shout out, right? A passive listening is a person who's not engaged or present, being reprimanded or having one difficult converse or having a difficult conversation. The listener is passive. So drop it in the chat when you are an active listener and what times you are an active listener and what times you find yourself just being a passive listener. And let's just see what people are, how people are feeling about that. Now, because I am an elder and I think that I have a lot of opinions about things, I often ask people when they come to me and they wanna talk, I say, well, what do you want from me? Do you want me to give you feedback or do you want me to just listen? I bet you can guess what they say. Well, Ms. B, I really would appreciate it if you would just listen to me. Now it's their loss because I'm not giving them all of my wonderful information, but I am able to provide them some co-regulations by using these tools, pearls, partnership, empathy, apology, respect, legitimation and support. So when you use pearls, you're not giving your opinion, you're not being judgmental, you're really, really focused, you have good eye contact with the person and you're very, very present and you help them to co-regulate by using these phrases or by giving them a con uh, well, difficult these days now, but, you know, giving them a hug or, you know, touching them or letting them know that you are present. So pearls. Now it wants us to do a little activity. When we or the people we work with are activated, and I don't use the word trigger because of the gun violence that's going on. Trigger is a word that makes me see a gun. And then that makes me feel traumatized. And then that makes me feel upset and not calm. So I've changed the word to tr from trigger to being activated. I hope that's helpful. So I want you to um, think about this as an activity, you might want to take a picture of it. It's an excellent activity to bring people back to the here and now. And I use it with my clients all the time. So first it's name five things that you can touch in the room. So they name them off and then take a deep cleansing breath. And it's four, one, five. Inhale to the count of four, hold it for one and exhale to the count of five. And the exhale is ah, like that so that you could really have your esophagus vibrate. It's like if you imagine yourself going out on Christmas Eve, shopping for 10 people, and you have a four-year-old with you, and you just get home and you sit on the side of the bed. And that breath ah, is the kind of cleansing breath that I'm talking about. And you could flip four, uh, five things that you can see. And for, I mean, four things that you can touch to four things that you can see, you could either do one or the other, right? Four things that, different things that you can see, different than the things that you touched in the room. Take a breath. Three sounds that you can hear. Two things that you can smell and one thing that you can taste. So this really brings a person back into the presence and it allows them to be able to center themselves again and be able to listen and uh, have some empathy. And it works for you as well to be able to be a listener, especially if somebody says something that causes you to feel activated or causes you to feel upset. If you have a situation where you're working with the client and you're just really powerless to help them, this activity will help you understand and know, and hopefully it will take you back to your boundaries, knowing which things are in your span of control and which things are outside of your span of control. So Beth, did you get something in the chat? Yes, there's some, some really great things in the chat. Um, people are saying they're active listener when they're with a friend. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in the conversation and passive when I'm not interested in the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, when they're engaged versus not engaged. Um, passive when I realize the person just wants to hear themselves talk. Um, and I think, you know, we've all kind of experienced that. 
Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I'm active when I'm talking with my daughter, passive when talking with my ex-partner, I'm assuming. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay um i understand that active listening more at work and become a passive passive listening by home more often um and an active listener when my children are telling me about their day and passive when my parents receive repeat the same stories over and over again watch it watch it from <laughs> sale i'm telling you Hey, 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 it's kind of <laughs> to listen while also writing, someone said. I thought that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're writing, thinking about that instead of paying attention to what someone's hearing. And then someone said, active when seeking advice and passive when I experience negativity. Um, and then someone also commented that tr the word trigger has reminded me of what some call a reminder or an urge to kind of use drugs, kind of a, a, a mm -hmm. difficult. So um, I'm passive when I'm overstressed about my own issues and active when I feel good and mentally. Um, let's see, again, about empathy, um, active listener and empathy when I'm tired becomes less, so more difficult when, they're t when you're tired and um, the importance of recognizing this person to breathe again when they realize that they are kind of tired and maybe not being as active as a listener as they need to be or mm -hmm. too overwhelmed. So this, this um, sensing that you're not being a very active listener and realizing that trying to correct that with some deep breathing or coming back to center. So some great, some pretty great comments. Great, great. And so you're also, active or passive uh, when you're passive, when you're exhausted, right? So you really want to be present, but if you woke up at two o'clock in the morning and you weren't able to get back to sleep and then you got up at five and you had to get everybody ready to go. And then you, uh, then you go to work and you try to be present, but you're really exhausted. So it's really very important to get enough sleep. There's also something going on right now that's called chrono, uh, chrono, uh, somnia, which is insomnia as a result of the coronavirus, coronasomnia. And so there are ways for you to work through that because your body is going to sleep at a different time. And it's not as much as it was when we were all working from home and we were all, you know, uh, not going up, out as often, right? And so it's difficult to sleep. I want to give you permission, however, if you have time in your day to take a nap, take a nap. If you feel like you're tired and you just need to lay down, I really want to recommend that you take the time to do that. Make time for that as a part of your self-care regime because your body is telling you that it needs to rest and there's too much stress and too much on your back that's causing you to feel burdened when you need to get up. Just take a little nap. And so when you go to bed, you want to turn your TV off. You don't want to have your computer activity going. Uh, at least 20, 30 minutes before you go to bed, right? And if you could turn your phone off, that's great. If you could turn your television off, that's even more greater, right? So just little tiny things that you could do to notice what you need. And paying attention to that inner voice is really what key, what's key and what matters. Your body, your mind, your spirit will tell you what you need to do. But we often ignore that first mind and go on and proceed. And then we run into some consequences where we find ourselves in trouble or find ourselves feeling really exacerbated. So this is when, when what gets most people through most of life's adversities is a caring adult who listen to them no matter what and believed in them. Now we're going to move on and switch gears again and talk about how biases impact our kindness and our ability to be present and show empathy in our therapeutic situations where we're not the therapists, right? So social cultural trauma is an understanding that social oppressions like racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, which is a fear of and hatred of um, immigrants can be experienced as trauma themselves. Most people experience a sense of threat and vulnerability based on something they can't change, the lottery of their birth. Context matters. And it happens with, and 
societal oppression and social cultural trauma. Racism is a system of white supremacy. Europeans during colonial expansion assigned human worth and social status using themselves as the model of humanity to legitimize white power and white skin privilege. Racism refers to the theory and practice of applying social, civic, or legal or double standards based on ancestry and the beliefs about the double standard. Racism first and foremost is a social practice, which means that it is an action and rationale for action or both at once. Racism, with, along with all of these isms, can take place on the individual and interpersonal level, as well as the historical and structural level. When all of these forms of oppression coincide, it creates what we call synergistic trauma which is particularly toxic and does not leave space for a good environment that is caring and kind. We all experience these, uh, experience social cultural trauma at one way or another, and I'll explain that. But what's important is that you recognize that it's not one thing or two things, it's several things might be going on at, a, at the several time, right? Traumatic, serious national disaster, the fires that are happening, the hurricanes or tornadoes in different parts of the country, right? And then we have all of this other oppression that's going on, that's topped on top of that. And all of this is synergistic trauma. And it's important for us to know and realize that we are being impacted by that in some way or another, even though it's not your, may not be your own personal experience. So we're gonna look at two students and we have different assumptions and expectations and biases based on the way that people look. These are called biases. And it's important to be aware of these assumptions and expectations because we are often mistaken and we do harm others, harm to others as a result. So I want you to take your, uh, unmute yourself and tell me what you think about this young man here. How do you identify, what would you say about him? How would you describe him? There's no judgment here. So just, Miss Tina, I see you took your mic off. Young. Young, okay. Mm -hmm. What um, else? Killer. Say that again? A killer, a shooter, school shooter. Oh, don't mess it up. Oh, sorry. A student. <laughs> a student. A student. Someone, someone who is privileged. Privileged, yes. Okay. I would also say an easy life. Okay. An easy life. Okay. Happy. Happy. Someone said I cannot describe him as I do not know him. Ah, okay. But you could divide, you could describe him based on what you see in front of you. If you saw this young man walking down the street, you'd have an opinion about him one way or another. That's just human, right? So Clean now let's cut. say it again. Clean cut. Clean cut, right? Nice little plaid shirt. Looks like we're assuming, we're assuming he's white. male and he identifies as a man. We're assuming, we're assuming that's true. He could be. That's a good point. Okay, now let's think about what you think what you think about when you see this young man. What biases come up for you? This is not a setup. I think I know him. But okay. um what do you think about if you saw somebody like that? Yeah. Um, someone um, since you don't have a that I was close with. with. That was what? That I was okay. close to. That you were close to. Okay. Anybody else? Somebody that loves his mother. Aw. Yeah. <laughs> someone said in the chat, a young black male. Okay. Someone said a lot of different things come to mind. A young man, nice hair. Mm-hmm. Someone in deep thought. Mm-hmm. Rapper. Okay. So if you endangered. Were, dangered. Okay. Dangered. Wow. That's Danger. Good. Yeah. And so those are called biases. You know, the other day when a Black Panther came out, a young black man that looked like him uh, was standing over to the side a little bit. And I automatically thought, now this is what I teach all the time, right? I automatically thought, I'm not gonna give him my phone to him because he might run off. That was an instant reaction. And my girlfriend said, stop it. I said, okay, okay, you're right, right? And so there were other times in my life when I'm driving down the street and 
at that time you had the doors that didn't automatically lock. And so I saw somebody that was coming up on my car, you know, when homelessness first got started really 10, 15 years ago. And I had to force myself not to lock that door because I made a commitment that I would not be afraid of somebody who looked like me. But biases are something that just come up and it's an instant reaction to a person, place, or thing, a situation, right? So one of the things that I want you to know, somebody already messed it up for me. Thank you very much. This, uh, the young white guy is Eric Harris. He's one of the Columbine shooters. And the black guy is Atatunde Ahmad. He's known for his academic success, 4.0, all the way through high school and all the way through college. And he was celebrated on the Ellen Show and other shows. I thought that was him. He's from Oakland. Oakland, yes. He went to Princeton or Harvard or yes. Stanford yes. or one of them. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but the point of is that, you know, you guys are reasonably kind and generous people. And so, you know, if you pay attention to your biases, you want to pay attention to what you see, think, and feel when you when you first acknowledge and see somebody. I remember a long time ago, I was getting off the bus and I had on a, a skull cap and I had on a, a hoodie and a, a peacoat jacket, right? So I, I, I kind of scared this woman. She got off the, off the bus and we crossed each other. And the, the move that she made was so subtle. She clutched her purse just enough to let me know that she was afraid of me. And I said, I'm, I'm not gonna hurt you, lady. Oh, oh, no, no, I didn't. It's like, it's okay, I'm not gonna hurt you. So think about having to walk around in the world like that. You know, Asian people have been being impacted by that more recently than, than over time like over since the pandemic, African-American men running and people laying in their bed, getting shot to death, right? We all have biases and implicit bias is one of the things that's important. So we're wired to make quick assumptions about people based on small pieces of information. The difficulty is, is that these assumptions are often tied to our biases and we all have implicit bias. If we're stressed out, our unconscious implicit bias tend to be stronger. We are more likely to be trauma inducing rather than trauma reducing. So what happens when a client comes into your office or you go into a client's home and the way that they live is different than the way you live or the child might have a different type of smell that you're used to on a, on a child in the morning. They come from a country that doesn't use deodorant, right? Or they go into the kitchen and heat up in the microwave fish, right? Or that some food that doesn't resonate with the types of food that you eat. And so you have an opinion about that, that might be subtle. You might have a response to that. You might have an ill or something like that. All of those types of things are what come through in our implicit biases. What matters here, though, is that we stay conscious and not let them come out in our interactions. And if it does come out, that you can apologize and take responsibility for your part in that. And then which in then turns to put our biases into the world and then they don't cause harm to other people. Anybody drop anything in the chat about that? Yeah, there have been some very um, interesting comments. Okay. Um, let's see, um, someone said, I think a society, society and media place biases on us without being aware of them until mm -hmm. the situation arises. So. You're not really as aware until you're in a situation. Mm -hmm. Some people are raised with biases. And then I'm just going to say someone said that they've experienced um, biases even on these Zoom trainings. So I'm really wanting to hear more about that. And Me too. Me too. So, so appreciate people being honest with us. This is how we change. This is how we grow. This is how we know. So this is really, really helpful. Um, thanks. That... Um, and trauma caused some biases. That's that's um, that's really interesting too. So, gosh, this is. Her. I wish we were live and in person so we could. I know. I know. It's more. So anyway, um, thank you everybody for um, your comments. Please keep them coming. Thanks. And I want to say, if anything that I say causes you to feel a certain way, I feel hurt, harm, or danger, please charge it to my head and not to my heart. And I do apologize. Correct me. That's the only way that I grow and learn. Correct and we, us. Absolutely. And we know that our intentions have impact. 
So I never say, oh, it was never my intention because the first thing that somebody could say, yeah, well, your intentions have impact. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I don't want to hurt anybody. Somebody mentioned the media. So uh, if you look at these two pictures here and uh, bias is reflected and reinforced, everyone is colluding with these biases. Notice the identical situations and how they are described. Notice the story that you tell about instances like this. Words make meaning, cause us to interpret, and makes a story about the narrative. So these are two pictures from Katrina. And if you notice, the first one is a young man walks through chest deep flood waters, looting a grocery store. And then the second, oh, this is two pictures of the same thing. So in the second one there, Two residents wade through chest water after finding. So you notice that the African-American person is looting and the, uh, the white person is finding things. So that's how the media plays into that type of those biases. And so, for example, microaggression, instances of direct subtle discrimination against members of a marginalized group are like tiny arrows in our back. One tiny arrow will survive, I mean, will hurt, but we will survive. But many people walking around with lots of arrows in their backs and one more arrow um, comment or microaggression can cause a big reaction because we don't know how many, many injuries this person has already uh, survived. If someone in front of you has a big reaction seemingly to a small thing, instead of asking yourself what's wrong, ask yourself what has happened to this particular person. Perhaps you unintentionally have made this person feel for the umpteenth time today that he doesn't belong here. So you just want to pay attention to those microaggressions and they hurt. I remember one time I had a big check. I had a horrible day and so I was going to be mean. And I had a big check to cash. Now I dress professionally working for the Department of Public Health. And I knew that if I went into that bank with a $5,000 check with all my identification, my diamonds blinging and my my uh, Rolex watch, I mean, my Apple watch and my nice earrings that she still was going to question me. And it was a, not a nice thing to do. And yes, she questioned me. And yes, she had to call about the check. And I just said, baby, I'm sorry. I should not have projected that on you. You give me the check back and I will go and cash it somewhere else. Been a, a participant at that bank for over 20 years, right? And so those kinds of microaggressions are things that happen and how you respond to them is what is very important. But the key here is, is that notice, if you're experiencing a microaggression or some, you're causing somebody else to feel a microaggression, like somebody said about the Zoom meetings where they feel you know, hurt or injured. Yeah, and, and I think people are really resonating with the photo. Um, people are feeling you know, that that's a good, example of how they often feel, how they're even feeling today. So mm -hmm. it's helpful. Exactly. Exactly. So now I'm going to um, come off camera here and give you some exercise, some activities so that we can get back in our bodies. Because that was a lot of information that may have caused you to feel some kind of way. So I want to invite you, this is a five-step holding exercise to get you to self-regulate. And it's when you take your hands and use them as the healing. So step number one is take your hands and just put it on top of your head, feel your hair, feel the warmth or the coolness of your hands and take a deep cleansing breath, four, one, five, in through your nose and out through your mouth. And just push a little pressure and you might wanna just close your eyes or have a downward gaze and take a breath and exhale. Now taking your right hand and putting it uh, to the back of your head at the bottom of your skull and take your left hand and put it on your forehead and making sure your baby finger is touching your eyebrow because this will release some cortisol to help you calm yourself and take a breath and exhale. Now take your right hand and place it over your heart and notice your heartbeat. Feel what it feels like to have your hand on your chest, keeping your left hand on your forehead with your finger on your eyebrow, calming you down. Take a breath. 
Now take your left hand and place it on your tummy, on your solar plexus, and feel the air as you inhale. Expand your stomach and go out as you exhale. And then finally, take your left hand and put it back behind your head and your right hand like over your heart again and take a breath. And exhale. And one of the things imp is important, and, and I want you to write this down. When you're doing this exercise, what you say to yourself is all is well. And you breathe in and you breathe out. And you say, everything is working out, is everything is working together for my good. And you breathe in everything and you breathe is out. Working together for my good. Everything is working together for my good. And then you say, I am safe right here, right now. Inhale. I am safe. Right here, right. Now. Exactly. All right. Thank you so much for that, for helping me with that. I hope that's a tool that you'll be able to use. Breathing is important. And so, yes, it begins with each of us with sympathy, empathy, and listening. Can somebody read this? It begins with the self. Can somebody read that? This is one of my favorite sayings. Navigating or functioning effectively in the midst of diversity is hard work. Mm -hmm. It is a learning process. It takes tremendous humility, recognizing that the way you view the world is not the only way. It takes guts. It takes a sense of humor. It takes willingness to say sorry, to admit we are wrong, to admit we are wrong. It takes nego negotiation and communication. Great. Thank you so much. Sure. So now we're going to look at a few more elements here. For me to share in someone's perspective, someone else's perspective, I must do more than mentally, merely put myself in the other person's position. Instead, I must imagine myself as there, and more importantly than that, imagine myself as them in the particular situation in which they find themselves. I cannot empathize with an abstract or detached feeling. To empathize with a particular person, I need to have at least some knowledge of who they are and what they are trying to do. As John Steinbeck wrote, it, makes, it means very little to know that a million Chinese people are starving unless you know one Chinese who is starving. And that ha that's so important. When I walk around the Bay Area now in Oakland and I look at the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who are hungry, who are camping outside, who are dealing with being unhoused. And these people are sick emotionally, mentally, physically. It's a really hard way to go these days. A more personal example is the pandemic. The COVID deaths were sad and my heart hurt for those who lost loved ones without even being able to be by their side when they transitioned. And then the deaths got closer when somebody I knew, knew somebody who caught COVID. And then something fell off my shelf in my heart when a friend who had been my friend for 30 years died suddenly. She was 60 years old and she had a heart attack due to COVID. And her daughter who is 30 lost both her parents within the nine month period. The last time I saw her, I went to her house and I, took her a pound cake because she had just lost her husband. And I didn't think that would be the last time that I saw her for sure. So we sat and we talked and we chatted with another friend. And then a few months later, I got the call that she too had made her transition. So it's important again to remember that it's nice to be nice to people. You don't know if it's the last time you're gonna see them, especially with what we got going on in our country and in the world today. So extending a hand of kindness uh, is often helpful. So empathy is often confused with pity, sympathy, and compassion, which are each reactions to the plight of others. Pity is a feeling of discomfort at the distress of one or more uh, beings, often 
excuse me, and often has paternalistic or condescending overtones. Implicit in the notion of pity is that the object does not deserve its plight and moreover is unable to prevent, reverse, or overturn it. Pity is less engaged in empathy, sympathy, or compassion, amounting to little more than a conscious acknowledgement of the plight of the object. Sympathy, a fellow feeling of community, uh, is, is a feeling of rare concern, of care and concern for someone who's often closed, accompanied by a wish to see him better off. Compared to pity, sympathy implies a greater sense of shared similarities together with a more profound personal engagement. So sympathy is when you have a connection, something that you experience and the other person experiences it as well. So anybody on here who has lost, their mother has made a transition, we and you and I can have sympathy together because we have a fellow feeling, a community of feeling, something that I've experienced and you experience. The person who has not lost their mother will not experience sympathy, but rather they will experience uh, empathy. I feel your suffering, right? Putting yourself in somebody else in sh else's shoes. And then finally, compassion or suffering alongside with someone is more engaged in simple empathy. It's associated with an active desire to alleviate the suffering of its object. So when you're working with your clients, that compassion, that listening, that you know, hand touching, that being present, that active listening is what we do. It's a therapeutic method and a therapeutic task to be kind to others and that you're not even a therapist. You're not even licensed. You don't practice, but you're being kind to one other person and you're showing them compassion. Compassion, which builds upon empathy, is one of the main motivators of altruism. So this is just another way to look at this. And you can see that uh, pity takes no effort. The larger the ball, the more effort it takes. And then understanding engagement it also takes a lot more effort. And then just a look real quick about the up and down of the empathy spectrum. It helps to understand empathy as a spectrum that we may move along, landing at different points, depending on the circumstances we find ourselves in. At any given point, experiencing more apathy in some settings, yet feeling highly uh, empathetic and emotional at other times. When you develop emotional attack, uh, emotional intelligence, we learn to harness the power of our experience and respond appropriately. We choose whether to slide the emotional eggs off the pan or if there's a benefit to continuing to experience these emotions as a means of connection. So midway through the spectrum are behavior patterns like narcissism and codependency. Although they are often presented as opposite extremes, in many ways they are closely related. Narcissism is self-centered self that relies on others to feed a grandiose facade, whereas codependent behaviors involve self-worthlessness that seek identity through serving the needs of others. Narcissism obliterates others for the sake of self, while codependency obliterates the self for the sake of others. It's hard to do good things to come, it's hard for good things to come of relationships where someone is being obliterated for whatever reason. So just notice when you're sliding into ways of I know better than you and compared to just taking on everybody's injury. So that they're at the opposite end of the spectrum. But when you're practicing in this arena, they could be very, very closely related. And when you have a client and you, you are operating with them as if I know better than you, start where the client is. Start where they are. Ask them, what is it that I can help you with today? What are you noticing in your body? How are you feeling? Slow actions, slow movements. Because most likely, the person that you're dealing with has been traumatized or has had some adverse childhood experiences, and they may or may not be in touch with them. My hope is that you're practicing and doing that ACES study with everybody that you work with, as well as the resilience study. And you can look on ACES Too High, that's A-C-E-S-T-O-O-H-I-G-H-T, H-I-G-H. Uh, dot com 
and you could see both the ACES survey as well as the um, resiliency survey. Anything in the, the chat? Yeah, I'm actually, I just put the ACEs too high um, link in the chat. Um, yeah, um, someone just was commenting on, um, sorry about your loss, um, your recent loss, Ms. B. Oh, very, very kind. Thank you. Okay, so what do we mean by listening with empathy? When talking about empathy, we're more likely to think of experiencing feelings of another, which is called emotional empathy. But two distinct types of empathy are developed when we listen, emotional empathy and cognitive empathy. In order to be effective listeners, we need to intentionally cultivate both. Let's look at each type in the context of listening. So listening with cognitive empathy is the first type of empathy that comes into play during conversations. It's perspective taking or cognitive empathy. Listening with cognitive empathy is listening until we understand how a person feels and understands what they think about the topic of discussion. More specifically, it's listening in order to understand how they think and feel about the topic based on their background. This is called an insider's perspective. For example, you could say, I can understand how you've come to that point of view based on the experience you had. That's not giving your opinion. That's not saying what you should or could or would have done. That's just being present with the purpose, purpose, the person in the moment, kind of providing therapeutic help without being a therapist. Kindness. This differs from assuming that how they think they might feel about the topic based on our background and outsider's perspective. For example, if I were in their shoes, I'd be doing X, Y, and Z. The falling of this, the failing of this outsider's perspective is that we're incorrectly assuming their story. Environment, culture, training, expertise, opinions, and beliefs, and how they feel about the topics are the same as ours but they are not. And no one's perspective will ever be exactly the same as ours. This means that we must seek to seek and develop cognitive empathy in every dialogue that we have. Because if we don't listen with empathy, then we, the end result will likely be a misunderstanding or even a disagreement. Cross-cultural interaction is a perfect example of an insider's and outsider's perspective. We often try to imagine what another culture is like in an outsider observer using our own worldview. Cognitive empathy, however, is understanding a culture by imagining ourselves as someone who has grown up inside that culture with their worldview. Admittedly, attaining the speaker's insider perspective is much harder than defaulting to our outsider perspective. This is because imagining what their situation is like is not the same as actually experiencing their situation. Even so, attempting to develop a, even a moderate amount of cognitive empathy with the speaker will still make us better listeners. It will help us more accurately interpret their message in the way that they intend it. So to put cognitive empathy into action, uh, for coworkers that we clash with, seeking to understand them can be helpful. This could include getting to know their personality type, their interests, their side hustles, their family. Being best buddies or account accountability buddies is not necessary, but it's always helpful. And it will help us to be able to accommodate each other's uniqueness. Society is colorful. Every day we engage with people holding completely different religious beliefs, political views, cultural norms, and core values. Better to understand these, better understand these differences and why they're important to each of us helps us to develop mutual respect. And it's not going up to somebody touching their hair or touching their face. It's just acknowledging that we come from different places and maybe having some inquiry about that and do it in a, in a kind and uh, a respectful way rather than just being intrusive 
you know, oh, and, and this is a place where microaggressions come in and you make up stories about where you think people come from and what is their life experience. I have a young uh, client and she's South, a Southeast Asian coming from India. And so she's 25 years old and she has one foot in America, but she's also connected to the cultures of her country as well. I call her a, um, an emancipated woman because she's operating through the, by, uh, through the cultural lens of being in America, but she also has a lot of empathy for the women that are still back in her country who are not valued, who are not seen as important, who don't have a voice. And it's difficult for her sometimes when she sees one of her core issues is discrimination against women. Uh, in that in that uh, aspect. So we work through that with empathy. I don't know what it's like to feel like that, but all I can do is be present for her and help her to understand that she does matter. And so listening with emotional empathy is the ability to share another person's emotions. In a second, I'll show you a short of a brilliant animated video that illustrates that. But when a person tells us how they feel, such as distressed or happy, we're emotionally empathizing with them. When we are experiencing those same emotions as though we were actually in that situation. So therefore, listening with emotional empathy is vitally important for, uh, for some types of dialogue. For example, Michael Sorensen, the author of a book called I Hear You, writes that many people aren't seeking advice when they relate to emotional situations to us. Mostly they're wanting a connection and validation. They're needed, they're needing to share that moment with someone who can experience their emotions with them, with them. They're needing someone to validate that it's normal for them to be feeling that way. So let's take a look at a little video. So what is empathy? And why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, Empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection.
I'm coming back. One moment. All right. So you can take a moment to drop a few comments if you have anything about that. Empathy versus sympathy. And so how did we only have a few more slides here. How to develop, uh, how to listen with empathy. Some, here are some tips on developing cognitive empathy. The active listening process is one that's a very effective developing cognitive empathy. So first of all, you wanna use your listening skills that we've been talking about today. Just listen, don't talk or interrupt except to ask questions. And once you understand their perspective, then you can share your views. Listen out for their feelings and use their own words as well as their actual words. And the funny thing is, if you want somebody to, re to clarify something for you, you could just use the last word in their sentence. So I feel really sad about going to the store. Going to the store? then that will encourage them to motivate, to continue the conversation about that particular thing. Use the person's words when you are talking with them and that will help them to know and understand that you are connected with them. Keeping an open mind, to listen with empathy, we must listen without judgment. Now that's really, really hard to do. This, it's just really hard to do, to not have judgment and not have biases. We wanna think that we can, but that's just how we're wired. The key here is with cultural humility, you pay attention to your biases and you pay attention to when you're judging another person. You want to, by letting go of perceived ideas of what they believe and feel, prepare to be continually surprised, Come prepare to be curious, temporarily suspend your own opinions and feelings about the topic so that you can truly hear what they're saying. And it's easy to disregard their intended message subconsciously and pounce on statements out of context in order to confirm our belief. This is known as confirmation bias. Clarify when you catch yourself jumping to conclusions. Ask the following, hang on a minute. I think you, I might be misunderstanding you. What did you mean by blah, 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 right? So encourage them to elaborate further with back channel signals. Mm, aha, go on. I often say, Tell me a little bit more about that. Go ahead and explain that a little bit further. And especially when they say, I don't know, I just say, well, let's just sit here and think about that for a moment. And once they start to know that, I don't know is not an answer, then they will be able to go in and explore. And just because they're not talking, it means that their brain is processing. So give a lot of spaciousness, a lot of time between the conversation. Silent, be comfortable with silence. Begin to get comfortable with silence. Because not always is talking and saying words enough. So um, you sound concerned about the service plan, for example. What's concerning you? Or you seem upset, excited, passionate by the culture, culture in the team. Tell me more. Always tell me more is always a good lead in. And then developing emotional um, empathy is a widely recommended approach for developing emotional empathy to imagine what it feels like in another person's situation. So in the video we just watched, Dr. Brene Brown, which is one of my favorite practitioners, she adds to this advice. She says that in order to connect with someone emotionally, we have to connect with someone inside ourselves that knows the feeling and also to develop emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is firstly being aware of our own emotions and those of the speaker. Then it's knowing a way to how to harness them in a way that enhances the conversation. A beneficial outcome of harnessing emotions is that we develop a healthy level of emotional empathy. And then finally, you don't need to agree to listen with empathy. Seeking to fully understand somebody's perspective doesn't mean that you agree with them. God knows people I don't agree with. It only means keeping an open mind and withholding judgment long enough to adequately understand the other person's perspective. So these are the six steps to developing cognitive empathy. And then our, finally, our goal as listeners, while listening to someone, our goal is to adequately understand 
the message that they're trying to convey to us. To achieve this, we need to listen again with empathy. That is, we must understand both their perspective and their feelings about the topic. Perspective taking or cognitive empathy. And I want you to know that this takes time. When you have a relationship with somebody, you're not going to just automatically jump in and understand where they come from and all of that. It takes time to building a relationship. I always say we all show up to relationships. Uh, our representative shows up. We have on our imposter face and we're not being our true selves until we begin to trust and until we begin to know that the person that's in front of us or the person that we're working with understands and has we have developed a trust and they understand that I I, I uh, comply with their needs and I'm willing to help them. So um, we want to avoid costly misunderstandings and, and we can apologize and say, I apologize. I misunderstood what you said. Connect more effectively with people, but are understanding their needs, developing trust and building rapport. And remember, this takes time. And finally, what's the one thing that you can do this week to better understand people that you will speak with? So I'm now I'm gonna stop my share. Some we have time for a conversation. Yeah, there's some great comments coming in. People are saying, okay. pay attention without distractions. Just listen. Uh, wait, waiting, have a waiting time and process before responding. Listen and not judge. Repeating back what they said, mm -hmm. urge them to speak more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, repeating back is really very important because if you repeat back, sometimes, you know, when you're in the, this listening mode or in the passive listening mode and you're thinking about something else, so your mind has wandered off and it's okay to say, you know what, tell me what it is that, what you meant. Help me understand. Tell me more about that. And that's really a, a good way to be empathetic and also be therapeutic, therapeutic. So I'd like for people to tell me one thing that they heard. We still got a little bit of time left. Um, yeah, and people can feel free to unmute themselves. Is that okay with you, Ms. B, if they have yeah. a question or comment? Question or comment, you can unmute yourself. If I said something that caused you to feel some kind of way, you can also tell me that, I promise. I'm not gonna run away. Um, I can call on people. <laughs> There's okay. some comments on, I work on self-regulation every day and I yes. can raise my hand to that as well. Yes. <clears throat> oh, and um, I'm going to listen to myself to see if I'm using the at least phrase, you know, with people, mm -hmm. so, you know, at least you can, you know, you can get pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, listen first, ask for clarification, Lish listen more and capture empathy. That's nice. Um, use nonverbal cues to indicate that you're listening and holding space for feelings. Mm -hmm. Someone said, breathe more. Oh, yeah, that's a good reminder. Uh, listen and comprehend what's being said, um, um, compassionate listening, reflective listening, good eye contact, um, stop and take a moment. Yeah, we, I, yeah, man, I know in my work, I'm also often moving so fast. I feel like I don't quite take enough time. Uh, remind myself that I'm safe when I feel overwhelmed. Mm, good one, good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah actively listen and don't just wait to respond yeah so really yeah that's that thing where sometimes it feels like someone instead of listening to what you're saying it feels like they're thinking about what they're going to say back yes. yeah you know I've had that feeling before silence can be healing and holding yeah exactly okay. mm -hmm. Listen to hear, not to answer. Excellent. We're going to make a book out of all of these ideas. I know, right? <laughs> right? Um, that it takes time to build a relationship uh, and trust. And trust takes time to build in a relationship. Mm -hmm. That's good. 
And feel free if you have a question or if you wanna make a comment, please feel free to unmute yourself, everyone. We have a little extra time here. Um, these are all good tips. Yeah, so maybe we'll download the, the um, chat and, and include these in a little handout we can send. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to say about eye contact, not eye contact is not appropriate in every culture. Mm -hmm. okay. So you can look at their third eye right here and it looks like you're looking them in the eye, right? You're gonna always do that, but depending on the culture, you know, that's not as individualistic and as forward as Americans. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they feel it might be offensive. And so it's part of you get clarification about that. You know, do you feel comfortable uh, having face-to-face -face contact? And another thing that's really important, I also do brain spotting, which is a technique that you use in therapy to deal with people who have suffered with severe trauma. And brain spotting uh, is you, uh, where you look determines how you feel. And so if you notice your own self as you're looking up and you're gazing at a particular spot, right? That's called gaze spotting. You, know, if you find yourself staring off at some point and then just go with what's coming up for you when you look at that spot. So what you can do is just think of a situation or think of an issue and then just take your eyes, span your eyes from left to right. And notice if you feel any change in your body when you hit a certain gaze spot. And so you look there and then, then you're into your subcortal part of your brain and your brain is processing that, right? So if I think of an issue, yesterday I thought of an issue that uh, I'm getting ready to go to New Orleans and I'm feeling a certain way about that, but I wanna go to see the temptations. In New Orleans, you know, their numbers are like off the chart mm -hmm. and I'm gonna be safe, but my issue is, you know, how safe am I going to feel in New Orleans walking around with a mask on with their numbers actually coming down a little bit? But the real thing is, and so when I thought about that, I started to feel, you know, a little bit nervous and I could feel the anxiety in my throat. And so what that meant was I was withholding from the woman that I'm going with because she really, really, really wants to go. And I'm really, 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 really challenged with it, but I'm going to support her. But my throat kind of got tightened up when I looked at my gay spot. So that helped me to know that I needed to tell her that I, I feel a little afraid about this right now. Okay, so gay spotting. When you find yourself staring off, find that spot. Notice what you're feeling in your body. You also want to notice when you have a resource spot. You have a spot in your body where you feel activated and tense, but also notice a place in your body. It could be your hands, your earlobes, where you feel calm, centered, and neutral. And then that's the place that you can go to when you're feeling activated. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Someone said expecting others to hold eye contact can be ableist, mm -hmm. and that's that's really good. Um, um, yeah, and someone said there. She's you've dropped so many jewels that have just given me answers to some deep life questions. Um, people hearing words that make them think once again that they don't belong. Mm -hmm. Interpretation is that not belonging, being a root of so much pain is so good. Um, getting to know someone's passions and goals is a great way to get to know them. Um, and if you are in a work or personal relationship where this is not happening, it's time to evaluate boundaries. This is great, um, such great. Oh, and then someone read about um, eye movements back and forth. Mm -hmm horizontally helps the brain to process trauma and that's EMDR. That EMDR, all... right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are, gosh, this is a great um, comments people are saying. Um, taking cues from the person you are, you are with and really noticing them in a deep way is, uh, this is great. While you guys are already compassionate, empathetic people, why do you come mm -hmm. on here? <laughs> I was just going to say that. They got great brain. answers. I'm really, yeah. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Um, yeah, well, if anyone wants to unmute, feel free. We have a couple more minutes. Otherwise, we can send you on your way a little earlier. Um, let's see. Ms. Jackson? Yes, Ms. B, you spoke earlier about a book that um, talked about when you're feeling stress in different parts of the body, what it uh -huh. means. Could yeah. you, um, you know, put the name and the author in the chat, please? Yes, ma'am. It's Louise Hay. Oh, Louise Hay. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Tell me one thing you got from the presentation today, Miss Jackson. 
Oh, you know, I got so much information. It just really made me think about the mental health in my body. In, I mean, in my family, because I come from a generation of mental health, mm -hmm. which resulted into a lot of um, alcohol and drug abuse. Okay. And um, it was, you know, in a Black community families really don't believe in therapy and stuff like that. So I was kind of like the first one in my family to stand up and say, Hey, I'm going to get help <laughs> for right. me and my kids and my family. And it just made me think about um, how mental health is just really so important. And I can never get enough classes that talk about mental health, um, having a self regime, taking care of you because for me, teaching kids is like a blessing for me to be able to do that. And yeah. one thing that I found is you have to really take care of yourself. You can't be there for someone and help them if you can't be there for yourself. Yes, yes. So I can never get enough of, you know, classes and trainings like this. And I'm just always looking for more information or literature or books that just can help me be present and just, you know, be that way. So I just really enjoyed everything that you said. Oh, thank you so much. I and please be it. sure to put that in the evaluation and what more you want um, as we create our calendar in the this year and moving forward, we wanna know what's gonna be helpful to you all. So. I appreciate you doing that. So you will always do the evaluations. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations, Ms. Jackson, for taking taking to, uh, the strides to break that generational trauma in your family and, you know, caring about your young ones and not being afraid to step out there, you know. And it's a lifelong process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Lifelong process. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, someone asked if we're going to be sending the slides, and yes, we will be sending the slides. And you will also be getting a link to this recording, so we will have the recording on our website. And I'll put a link in the chat as to where we have all of our other recordings. And uh, really hope that you'll be able to go check some of them out, um, see if there's something in there also that you want to be uh, watching. We have a YouTube channel and. We're just starting to try to create a little library in our YouTube channel as we're getting more and more trainings there. So hopefully we'll create some categories that are interesting to you. Ms. B, once again, thank you so much for being with us today. Just so appreciate and love you. And um, man, yes. You I'm, gonna, I'm also going to attach, uh, I have a, a, a cookie recipe that's called COVID cookies. Excellent. And so they have three different kinds of chocolate, oh. walnuts, pecans, and um, semi-sweet dark chocolate and milk chocolate cookies. And so, and if you have a sugar issue, you could sweeten it with malt, malt sugar. If you okay. have a gluten issue, you could make it with almond flour. Okay. But um, these are the kind of cookies you can't eat with your shoes on because you got to wiggle your toe. So. <laughs> I love it. This is great. All right. I remember the days when uh, you would bring cupcakes or cookies and we'd have food at our training. I sure miss those days. I miss seeing everybody's face and yeah. table conversations. And we'll look forward to hopefully maybe in the new year being able to do some. We're trying to reconfigure our conference center to see how we'll be able to do some things safely in person. But uh, anyway, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. Um, yeah, some people's comments, um, Ms. B saying, every time I think I've taken the best training, I take another one that outdoes the last one. <laughs> awesome. Um, thank you very much, Ms. B. Thank you, um, Leah, for all of the help. And we appreciate every one of you. So as per usual, we're going to say goodbye for now and hope to see you at our next training.